The Holy Gospel according to Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them, the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from our God who creates us, redeems us, and makes us a holy people. Amen. You know, when Christianity sells, sometimes what sells is not necessarily the Jesus movement, but the idea that God has only blessings in store for us. That God is simply a means to an end, kind of like an ATM. That God becomes a means to my end of self-fulfillment or prosperity or even protection from a deadly virus. But according to the gospel of Mark today, Jesus had one word for preachers of such a message. And that word is Satan. Get out of my way, Satan get lost. You have no idea how God works. Don't run from suffering. Embrace it. Take up your cross and follow me. Ew, that's not something anyone wants to hear. What does it mean to carry one's cross? One of my spiritual mentors is a United Church of Christ pastor named Flora Slauson Wellner, W-U-E-L-L-N-E-R. I resonate with what she says about carrying your cross, about this challenging idea. She says the cross that we're summoned to carry is God's invitation to enter share, and lift the burden of suffering for others. It's not the same as illness or disasters that come upon us against our will. There's no choice in those sorts of calamities. But when it's a cross to carry, it's different. We're always given the freedom to accept or to reject a cross. If we accept, we enter into the pain of another person or a community with loving, redemptive power as a member of Christ's crucified and risen body. When it comes to accepting and carrying our cross, there are a couple things to consider. 
first, and this one is pretty important, we prayerfully discern if it is really our cross. If it is truly the commitment to which God invites us, there will be joy along with the pain. We will feel the renewal of our strength and our energy. We will feel an increasing sense of authenticity. But if we feel decreasing joy, decreasing strength, decreasing energy, decreasing meaningfulness, and decreasing authenticity over a significant period of time, or if we've accepted the task under compulsion, it may either mean that we have picked up a cross intended for someone else, or that God may be calling us out of that commitment. Been there, done that? I hear you. Second, Wellner says, as we carry our cross of loving commitment, it's essential to know that the crucified, risen, and living Christ is carrying the ultimate weight and pain. If we try to carry it alone, drawing only on our willpower or our unaided strength or our lonely love, we become quickly vulnerable to exhaustion and burnout. Then what happens? Our original love becomes angry manipulation of others. And we find ourselves feeling resentful. Been there, done that? Me too. This is not what Jesus meant when he talked about bearing your cross. Jesus explains himself for those who want to save their lives will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. If you want to engage your grandchildren and see a thoroughly modern parable that illustrates this whole idea, watch the Pixar animated movie Soul, S-O-U-L. Jamie Foxx and Tina Fey's voices will take you on quite a ride, but by the movie's end, this is where you'll end up. Those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and the sake of the gospel will save it. I thought about this when I came across a story by Casey Hawley. She was on a business flight out of Orlando. Soon after takeoff, the plane appeared doomed to crash. Holly looked at the faces of fellow business travelers. She was stunned. Many looked visibly frightened. Even the most stoic looked grim and ashen. There were no exceptions. No one faces death without fear, she thought. We've certainly learned that in these days of COVID. Everyone on that plane lost composure in one way or another. She began to search the crowd for one person who felt the peace and calm that great faith gives people in these circumstances. She saw no one. Then a couple of rows to her left, she heard a still, calm voice, a woman's voice, speaking in absolutely normal conversational tone. 
There was no tremor, no tension. It was a lovely, even tone. She had to find the source of this voice. All around, people cried. Many wailed and screamed. Finally, she saw her. In the midst of all the chaos, a mother was talking, just talking to her child. The mother was staring full into the face of her daughter, who looked to be four years old or so. The child listened closely, sensing the importance of her mother's words. The mother's gaze held the child so fixed and intent that she seemed untouched by the, the sounds of grief and fear all around her. Holly tells how a picture flashed into her mind of another little girl who had recently survived a terrible plane crash. Speculation had it that she had lived because her mother had strapped her own body over the little girls in order to protect her. The mother, that mother, did not survive. The newspapers had been tracking how psychologists were helping that little girl who survived for weeks afterward to ward off feelings of guilt and unworthiness. Those feelings often haunt survivors. The child was told over and over again that it wasn't her fault, that her mommy had gone away. Holly was hoping this situation would not end the same way. Holly strained to hear what this mother was saying to her child. Over and over again, in reassuring tones, the mother said, I love you so much. Do you know for sure that I love you more than anything? Yes, mommy, the little girl said. And remember, no matter what happens, that I love you always and that you are a good girl. Sometimes things happen that are not your fault. You are still a good girl and my love will always be with you. Then that mother put her body over her daughters, strapped the seatbelt over both of them and prepared to crash. Then for no earthly reason, the doomed plane landed safely. It was over in seconds. The cross we are summoned to carry is God's invitation to us to enter, share, and lift the burden of suffering for others. When I think about it, I think we could say that this is what your transition team and your leadership are doing now. They've been leading you through this important time of transition and in the midst of a pandemic, no less. It is a cross they are carrying because they have willingly accepted it. We reviewed the findings of the transition team's work two weeks ago. A vision has emerged, sharing the TLC worship experience. The transition team is morphing into the call committee and has begun filling out the ministry site profile. That's a document that is quite involved and is full of some really challenging questions. The group last Tuesday worked their way through it with me. And it will be submitted before names of candidates are presented for interviews. Your leadership team is beginning to work on goals that Rob shares in the March newsletter. Maybe this cross is also yours to bear. 
maybe you are being summoned to join this work of sharing the TLC worship experience and all that involves. I'm reminded of a challenge from William Temple, a one-time Archbishop of Canterbury. The church, he said, is the only society on earth that exists for the benefit of non-members. The church is the only society on earth that exists for the benefit of non-members. That's the mindset of churches that grow. Knowing you exist for the benefit of the people who are not yet here. Those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and the sake of the gospel will find it. That becomes a way of carrying your cross should you choose to accept it. I can promise you it is a challenge, but not one without joy. When we bear our cross, the cross we are called to bear, we do not bear it alone. Surrounding us are the arms of a God who loves us like that mother on the airplane loved her child. A God who says to us, no matter what happens, my love will always be with you. A God who through Jesus and his cross puts his body over ours and straps the seatbelt. It's because of this kind of love that we are free to bear our cross without compulsion, to seek not so much to be consoled as to console, not so much to be understood as to understand, not so much to be loved as to love. Because of this kind of love, contrary to popular opinion, God is not the means to our end. No, we become the means to God's end. And that is where we find our lives, where we find fulfillment. So, in giving, we receive. In pardoning, we are pardoned. And in dying, we are born to eternal life. This is the journey of Lent, which we walk as brothers and sisters in the crucified and risen body of Jesus Christ. Amen.